Welcome back to Big Sky Buckets. I'm Big Sky, and today we're going to talk about the knockout stage games from last night of the in-season tournament and how they went. My thoughts on the in-season tournament thus far, reevaluating. Did these games meet my expectations? And then maybe a little bit of a preview for tonight's two in-season tournament knockout stage games because they are vastly different than last night in terms of the kind of teams that are playing. But before we begin, if you're new to the channel, please consider subscribing. I'd appreciate every subscription as I get this thing up and going. It would mean a lot to me. Give it a like, give it a comment. If you're an audio only listener, give it a rate, give it a listen, and let's get into it. So we need to start with the obvious here, which is what everyone has been saying in, in the media in general. Adam Silver did it again. He did it again. And this is the logical, to me, this is a logical step up from the play-in in in a way where it's much more like March Madness because there's more games involved in general. I don't know if you can say there's as much on the line, but this is a play. The knockout stages have showcased through two games. This is a playoff setting. The teams care. There's you can you can feel the emotion of these players just through the screen. I mean, this is exactly what I wanted. I was more skeptical during the group stage play because with every team involved, it was kind of hard at sometimes to watch these games in figure if this was going to translate to the same degree, but it's very obvious. So we'll skip over this because yes, this is what you want. This is great. And this is a great way to get people invested in the NBA pretty early on into the season. Shout out to Adam Silver. I know it's really early, but it seems like he got something here. Now let's talk about the games. Both these games were honestly pretty great. To me, both of them, despite leads and all of that, felt evenly matched. And I want to talk about the winner of the first game in the Pacers and Celtics. Pacers won 122 to 112. My biggest criticism of the Pacers thus far has been, I'm wondering if they're just capable of playing defense and that they might need to be a buyer to get more defense in. They might still need to be a buyer, but they have at least proven me one thing. When a game truly matters, they can play defense. And that's what happened. That That's really the turning point of this game. And along with Tyrese Halliburton just going insane, he logged his first career triple-double, which is huge. And he really torched the Celtics, no matter what who the defender was, in the third quarter. And I, I've seen this before in the Hawks-Pacers in-season tournament group stage game, where just in the third quarter, it's like, oh, wait, what if I just make every shot? And that's kind of what happened. He might have missed a couple more, but damn, he's good. Damn, he is good. And, you know, all the credit in the world to him. The other two players for the Pacers that really stood out to me were obviously Buddy Heald, and we know what he does, but him getting to the rim a lot more in this game was a big, important factor. And then, finally, Aaron Neesmith, who was drafted by the Celtics, so a revenge game, in 2020, same year as Tyrese Halliburton, and he didn't really get as much play time as he maybe should have, as we're seeing now that it's really panning out. He was traded last offseason, not this past one, the year before that, for Malcolm Brogdon. And I'm pretty certain Aaron Nesbeth hates the starters for the Celtics. It's pretty obvious that he's like friends with a couple of the bench players because he used to play on the bench for the Celtics. Because like after the game, he's like dapping them up and just not acknowledging the starters. And then during the game, he's calling like, I think it was Derek White or Drew Holiday. Like he's too short and just like like he was playing with his heart on his sleeve and he looked pissed like he was talking shit the whole game. And I respect that. I respect that. But just heads up, I, I think Aaron Neesmith really hates the Celtics, but he played phenomenal. Uh, he played great defense. This second, the second half versus the first half was so these were such different games where Pacers were going with their normal game plan, which is like, let's just make every jump shot. And a lot of that did pan out well, but they couldn't really, they weren't scoring as much around the rim. And then in the second half, they really changed that up. A lot of players like Buddy Heald and Aaron Neesmith and even Miles Turner getting to the rim and making them pay there so that the Celtics were just confused defensively of what to do because Tyrese Halliburton is just destroying you from three currently. And then everyone else is just taking it to the rim and you can't stop a single one of them. Just great stuff from the Pacers. And this this means a lot because this defense was played from both sides and the Pacers came out and won. And for the Celtics, yes, they didn't have Kristaps Porzingis. I know that probably would have made a difference because I've been high on him. But you have to look at this in general of 
The last time these two teams played, the Celtics destroyed the Pacers by like 40 points. And here, if Kristaps Porzingis makes that much of a difference on this offense and defense, this is a concern in terms, and I'm sure a lot of people have talked about this. This is a concern for the Celtics in general that this could end up biting them in the ass. And I've seen reports this morning of the Celtics might, the Celtics are most likely going to be very active during the trade deadline. And I think that should be the case. I still feel like even though they got a lot of assists, there was just like a one assist difference between these two teams. It still feels like to me, the Celtics who are a good team. They're a great team, actually. There's just not a lot of plays typically being run. Like there was a lot in the first half, especially when they were down of just kind of let one guy dribble the hell out of the ball and everyone kind of stands around and waits for maybe a drive and kick. And I don't love that from this team that has so much talent, personally. I also don't love it when Jalen Brown or Jason Tatum decide like, it's my time to go. And there's one play near the end of this game where Jalen Brown is just trying to take it to the rim, head of steam with like three defenders in front of him. Where it's like, all right, now is the perfect time to try to kick the ball. But, you know, he, he doesn't. So it's like, okay, this was a, <laughs> this is just a terrible play. Sometimes when I come on here and I talk about how there's not enough playmaking in general, I'm sure there's like pushback because it's like, oh, then why are they winning all these games against good teams? And I think it's literally just because of overall talent in that during the half court playoff offense like tonight this has a has this has potential to be a problem for this team overall and so i think if the celtics are going to be buyers during the deadline they need to be looking for genuine playmakers personally i i drew holiday and Derek white are great defensively but they struggle sometimes. I, I like Derek White a little bit more than Drew Holiday, even though Drew had a solid game. So it feels like someone needs to get in there and be like, hey, we're going to run this play and that play. And Derek White will do that occasionally, but that shouldn't be the number one thing. Derek White is the jack of all trades kind of player, and that's very helpful. But the, the real difference was when the Pacers turned this around, they're just running all over the place. They're, they're this, this constant movement, and I've talked about movement offense in general, it needs to be more of a thing for the Celtics team that has so much talent. And we did not see that as much tonight. And to, to me, that the Pacers playing defense and the Tyrese Halliburton just outburst in the third, those were the turning points of the game. So shout out to the Pacers. They move on. Celtics have some things to work out, but again, not the end of the world. But I was wrong here. I thought the Celtics were a really bad matchup for the Pacers, and I was wrong. But the next game, I was right. I was right. Let's go. So, so the Kings Pelicans game. This, <laughs> it's funny because when you first start this game, my thought process was I got it wrong again. I might be a bona fide fraud because the Kings just came into this game and lit the hell out of the Pelicans in the first like five minutes of this game. And I was like, all right, this might just be, uh, this might be a wash and it might have one really great game and one really bad game. Nope. The Pelicans had some fight in the first quarter. They were down like 17 or it was somewhere between 13 and 17 points in the first quarter. And then the bench came in and this is where the Pelicans ended up winning this game. Let's start with there. Pelicans won 127 to 117 in Sacramento. So shout out to them. But really the game changing Thing here was Willie Green in his rotations, especially having a bunch of the bench players constantly around at least one of the starters, one of CJ, Zion, and most importantly, Brandon Ingram, who went straight up 50% from everywhere in this game and had a 30 bomb. He was great. He was, he was phenomenal. And the, the Kings do deserve some credit. The game plan to me seemed very much like we're not going to let Zion get what he wants. And that's what happened. Harrison Barnes played great defense on Zion and the game plan of packing the paint whenever Zion has the ball worked very well. What didn't work out well is that the game plan for Brandon Ingram for most of the game up until near the fourth quarter was one-on-one -on -one defense. And then eventually they started having defenders double him. And I think it was just a little too late at that point because they let a couple of these shooters, like Herb Jones had a great game. It's like Jose, Trey Murphy the third, CJ, Herb Jones, and Brandon Ingram all started making threes. And so they all were super confident. And at that point it was, we 
whenever you double one of Brandon or Zion, one of these guys is going to, they're going to kick it out to one of these shooters who's going to be wide ass open and knock it down. Now, they weren't always wide open. I really give the Kings defense a lot of credit in this game. It's just that when the bench came out for the Pelicans, along with having Brandon or one of the starters on, this was just a completely different game from the first quarter. And, and that's kind of what happened is that in the second quarter, the Pelicans won out by nine points. They went down in the first quarter by one, and then they won the third quarter by one, and then they won the fourth quarter by one. And really here, in just in general last night, they let the players play pretty aggressive defense like in the playoffs. And to some players especially in the first half of this game, they were not prepared for that level of physicality or they were expecting calls. And it's not a shot at De'Aaron Fox, who I like a lot, but there were a lot of times where De'Aaron either there was a no call on a play that maybe should have gotten him to the free throw line or he believed should. And the players here started getting irritated. The other part, the shots that were falling early for the Kings, they were just raining threes. They stopped falling. And they did not really adjust to that until the second half of this game. And at that point, it just kind of remained like typically a 10-point lead for the Pelicans. So every time that they, the Kings would go to the free throw line, which they went a lot, the Pelicans would find a way to answer back. And a lot of that was Brandon Ingram in the mid-range. But sometimes it was the, the battle between Sabonis and Valanchunas in the paint was pretty fun to watch because they were getting into it. And just, it was just a super physical battle. Valanciunas ended up getting uh, fouled out in this game, but it was a little too late at that point for the Kings to come back and win. And so that that was a really big factor here is that they, even though Sabonis had a triple double in this game, which is huge, it just kind of, because he would lose during certain possessions on second chance points for the Pelicans against Valanciunas, that kind of made a massive difference down the stretch of this game because they were trying so hard to come back. And one of the main, the, the three guys that made the biggest difference for the Kings is obviously Fox, who's you're going to live and die by how much he's going to get you. He had 30. DeMontis Sabonis, triple double. So he played well. And honestly, there's two guys vying for this third spot. Malik Monk, who was great offensively for them and just kept losing the battle defensively. And Keegan Murray. So I think the main criticism here for the Pelicans win is probably going to be Keegan Murray, who's had a back issue for a little bit, seemed to have that flare back up near the end of the second quarter. And then he came back and played. I think a lot of people will make the argument that he wasn't 100% of himself. And he was the main, he, he was the one who held Brandon Ingram early in the game to not being as much of a factor as he would inevitably become. And that probably was the nail in the coffin. The other nail is that unless your name was Malik Monk off the bench, you gave this team basically nothing for the Kings. Keon Ellis, five points. Trey Lyles, five points. Sasha Vezinkov, goose egg. JaVale McGee, goose egg. They had to play a lot of their starters a lot to try and come back in this game. And it just didn't pan out the way they wanted it to. And that's that's kind of the, the, the story of this game is the Pelicans' depth feels very real and the Kings might need to be buyers at the trade deadline because in a game that mattered the bench other than Malik Monk I think front court bench depth is a big factor here and they I, they need that a lot they basically had this game plan the Pelicans of if Herb Jones is not guarding to De'Aaron Fox we're going to put Dyson Daniels on him and that is really the bench depth here that that's the story of this game is that Darren Fox probably could have had a lot more, but he had to work for everything. And so it came down to more of their role players needing to step up. And that just didn't end up panning out. So it was a great, I honestly thought this was a great game. There's more fouls called in this game. And it was definitely chippier than the last game because there was some technical fouls and all of that. But this is a great start. This is genuinely a great start to the knockout stages. So, and I, I'm super happy about these. I'm glad I got at least one of the my predictions right so far. Uh, I had the Celtics winning the whole thing, so I can't. It's not going to go as great anymore. But <clears throat> I was right about the Pelicans. Their depth coming back from injury. They're starting to 
get it going. And there's there's just so many talented guys that impact winning. And that's that's kind of the tale here. Darren Fox gave you De'Aaron Fox and DeMontis Sabonis gave you their all. It's just you start asking questions about yes, Harrison Barnes' defense was great, but do you need a better offensive weapon at the three? Um, you know, Trey Lyles, Keon Ellis, Sasha Vezinkov, and Travail McGee didn't really impact the game as much as you want. You probably need a better defender than Kevin Hurt. There's just there's more questions for the Kings here in terms of depth. And I think this is they will most likely be a buyer because they are also a very good team. But going forward to tonight's games, the major the reason I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about the major difference is that the two if you look at this from the point of view is the two teams that didn't make the playoffs last year won these two games and that there could be something here for young teams that are starting to find their stride or starting to showcase themselves to the NBA world that they might be legit. Maybe not like cont- championship contender status, but we're going to be in the playoffs. One of you, like one of the top tier teams is probably going to face us. That That's kind of what last night was with the Pacers showcasing, we can beat the Celtics and Pelicans showcasing, even in Sacramento, we can beat this team. But tonight you have Lakers Suns who were both in the playoffs last year and you have Knicks Bucks who were in the playoffs. So I'm more, I'm really interested to see who comes out of those, but who's going to have a little bit more fight in these games because it's not like they've never been in a playoff setting or they missed it last year. So that's a really interesting thing. I'm starting to maybe see I, I would still probably see the Lakers because LeBron will take this very seriously. And I had the Lakers winning this game. But I'm I'm interested to see now, before I thought, okay, the, the Knicks will probably lose to the Bucks. I think I'm starting to see the vision of, because the Knicks are a little bit younger, of them having a little bit more fight, a little bit more spirit. But we'll see what happens tonight. And I, I can't wait to talk to you guys tomorrow about them. And hopefully they're just as good as these games, if not like at least half as good, because that's what that's what you want. But thank you guys so much for watching, listening, subscribe, like, comment, all of that. Peace.